strangest dream an angel carried me to heaven's gates glory flowed out of golden streams the angel said go right in celebrate but then the angel asked me what if Jesus wasn't there what if he were still out on a cross somewhere what would you say tell me what would you say what would you do I woke my pillow wet with tears Oh, so happy that it wasn't real Still how that dream so filled with fears Changed the way that I think and feel all of us should ask what we're really longing for special things for us or the honor of our lord what would you say tell me what would you say what would you do Good morning. You're a beautiful sight. I want to uh, share with you another miracle. <clears throat> God is so good. It is a miracle that I'm even here. On Tuesday night, after we finished a very long board meeting, <laughs> it got extended, Billy, beyond your time here. <clears throat> I was on my way home. Got as far as the development in which I live. And the speed limit in the Russell Springs development is very low. So I was not going very fast. But it was almost 11 o'clock at night. There are no street lights on Russell Springs Drive. And as I headed up to the top of the street, I quickly could see a little deer coming from somebody's lawn into the front of my car. And even though I wasn't going very fast, even though I could see it and I applied my brakes, I still hit it. I cannot even tell you what an awesome feeling that is to see a little creature 
there in the road that you have hit and hurt. And as that little deer lay there in the road, I wanted so much to get out and help it. And I could see it struggling to get back upon its feet. And I felt so sorry that I had hit it. And then it finally was able to get up on its legs and run away. I was so traumatized by that. And it's now about 11 o'clock at night when I get home. That when I pulled into my uh, garage, I did not even have the courage to look at the front of my car to see what kind of damage had been done. I thought, no, I will not sleep if I see that. So I'm just going to wait until morning. It won't change during the night. I'm just going to go to bed. So I went to bed and prayed that God would clear my mind so I wouldn't think about it. And in the morning when I got up, <clears throat> it's still pretty much on my mind, <laughs> But I said to myself, no, I better eat breakfast first because I'll lose my appetite once I see my car. So after I had finally gotten dressed for the day, had breakfast, then I said, okay, you have to look at it sometime and it might as well be now. So I went out to the garage to look at the front of my car. When I looked at my car, there was not even a scratch not even a scratch on my car. Another miracle that God worked. So I'm just praising him this morning for his many, many, many miracles that we can point out throughout our congregation. I want to thank Mike Little for helping me so much with the graphics that we're going to be using this morning. They're to his credit and not to mine. And I'm so thankful I don't even have a remote that I have to control. <laughs> That is wonderful. So let us pray. Oh, Father in heaven, if only I could be a nail on the wall on which you could hang a lovely picture of Jesus Christ, your son, my prayer would be answered. Thank you, Father, in Christ's name. Amen. I have told you before how much I love the study of astronomy. I so eagerly look forward to eternity when I can study the vastness and the beauty of God's great universe. I've decided I'm going to major in astronomy when I enter the school of the hereafter. I'm going to do a double major and major in music. I want to be able to play like we heard. I want to be able to sing like we heard. Thank you, ladies. Beautiful addition to this morning. The title of our sermon is A Speck in Space. Why is it important to God? Even though our Earth is the fifth largest planet in our solar system, with only Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune being larger, and even though it is the largest of the terrestrial planets, the ones that are the closest to the sun, including Mercury, Venus, and Mars, yet we are only a speck in space when compared to the vastness of the entire universe. But oh, how important that speck is to God. This morning it was mentioned something about Job and the trials that he went through, the things that God took away from him and what God brought back to him. When he was in a conversation with his friends, he at one point started to defend God and said, but do you know that God can do this and God can do that? And he said, God alone spreads out the heavens. And he went on to say he made the bear he made Orion and the Pleiades. Orion is one of the most conspicuous and recognizable constellations in the night sky. It is visible throughout the entire world. Remember that. It is visible throughout the entire world. Adventists have long believed <clears throat> 
that Christ will come down through that open space in Orion. But there is another reason why Orion is important, and I'm going to tell that to you before I sit down this morning. I want to give you three main reasons why the speck in space is important to God, and it comes to you all a birdie. That's my three reasons why the world is important to God. One, the very first one, we are told in a precious book entitled Desire of Ages, that our little world is the lesson book of the universe. Our little world is the lesson book of the universe. Then we're told that the whole universe is watching with inexpressible interest the closing scenes of the great controversy between good and evil. We're the only dark spot in God's great universe. Ours is the only planet that's contaminated with sin. There is no sin anywhere else, and we have that guarantee in God's word. With all that is happening in our world today, the hatred, the fighting, in the Middle East, it is just unbelievable what is going on there. The persecution that is going on already with Christians, the molestation, I wonder what do those worlds out there think when they look at us? If we are the lesson book, surely we are helping them to understand that sin is destructive and ugly. <clears throat> but this planet is the only one in the universe where the Son of God has lived, where he died, just to save people like us, the sinful people. And he's promised to make another trip back down here to this little speck in space. So this morning I want to spend some time reviewing with you what is going to happen, what has happened, in between those two trips. He made the first trip when he came as a baby. He lived for 33 and a half years among us, and then he died. Went back to heaven and he's coming again. <clears throat> Great changes, we are told in testimonies, that are soon to take place in our world. And the final movements will be rapid ones. You've got the picture. They're going to happen quickly. The Bible gives a correct view of these things because in the Bible are revealed the great scenes in history as well as the future of this planet. God always gives warnings before coming judgments come upon us or great events take place. Those who have faith to believe in God's warnings are saved. We look at Noah, and the word came to Noah, Noah, come thou and all thy house into the ark. For you I have seen righteous before me. And at 600 years of age, Noah believed, went into the ark, amidst much, much criticism. But he and his family were saved. The message came to Lot. Lot, get up. Get out of this place, for the Lord is going to destroy the city. Lot placed himself under the guardianship of the heavenly messengers, and he was saved. Christ's disciples were given warning of the a destruction that was coming on Jerusalem. Those who watched for the sign of the coming ruin fled the city, escaped the destruction. So now we are given warning that Christ is going to come again and that destruction is going to come upon the earth. And those that heed the warning are going to be saved. Simple as that. Simple as that. I would like you to open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24. That will be our biblical setting this morning. We're going to be looking at some of the things that Christ has told us there. 
This chapter is a very well-known chapter to most Adventists. For it is here that we see the signs that, God, that Christ has given to us in his own words as to what was going to happen. In verse 1 through 14, that foretells us a lot that was going to be happening just before the destruction of Jerusalem and the fall of the Jewish nation. Much of that is going to be repeated before the end of time. But beginning with verse 21, the signs foretell, foretold there point exclusively to the end of the world. I would like you to look down at verse 29. <clears throat> Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven will be shaken. The tribulation that is spoken of there was the 1260 years of papal persecution. The sign of the darkening of the sun and the moon is mentioned in other places in the Bible, but keep your finger on Matthew 24. But in Mark chapter 13, verse 24, but in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 13, verse 10, for the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened and it's going forth, and the moon will not cause the light to shine. Then finally in Revelation 6, and then we're going to go back to Matthew 24. I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. These signs in the heavens were to be introduced by an exceedingly great earthquake. <coughs> HMS Richards, in his book, What Jesus Said, says this could be none other than the great Lisbon earthquake which occurred November 1, 1755. <clears throat> Excuse me. It occurred on Sabbath morning about 9.30, which was an All Saints holiday in Lisbon, Portugal. <clears throat> it affected nearly 4 million square miles of the Earth's surface. A geologist wrote that in six minutes, 60,000 people perished. Six minutes. <coughs> the, and, and another writer wrote, the earthquake had made all men thoughtful. They mistrusted their love of drama and filled the churches instead. It's God's intention that when a natural disaster happens, that it will turn man's attention to the living God. Then there were to be earthquakes in diverse places. I don't know about you, but I have lived through two major earthquakes. One in San Francisco and one in Southern California. The one in Southern California was in a motel. There in... Uh, that area for a business meeting. And when it happened, I was sitting up in bed studying my Sabbath school lesson. So it happened just soon after daybreak. <clears throat> it literally shook the room. In fact, it felt like some kind of a giant train had hit the motel and shook the motel. <clears throat> and at first I thought, what was that? And then when I realized that it was an earthquake, now, <clears throat> do I stay here or do I get out? You never know whether there's going to be another follow-up to that. <clears throat> and so I finally decided I better get dressed and get out of the room. But before I could do that, we had an aftershock that also shook the room. <clears throat> After we uh, left the motel, and I was on my way to the conference office in Southern California, then I was driving down a street, and I can tell you 
that the greatest aroma that morning came from a liquor store. <laughs> it had shaken those bottles of evil right off the shelves, <laughs> broke them open, and spilled their insides. <laughs> so I remember that earthquake. And I also remember the one in San Francisco. So there have been earthquakes in many places. In fact, Alonzo Baker, an American journalist, spoke about earthquakes, and he said during the 50 years beginning with 1875, there were more severe earthquakes than in the preceding 850 years. Earthquakes continue. And then we had many others after that. Even though scoffers have a tendency to tell us Oh, you talk about his coming. Everything continues, that is, it was. And they themselves are a sign of the end. But nothing does continue just as it was. Because we have the greatest wars going on, the greatest pestilences, the greatest famines. If you get any of the information that Adra sends out, you know that there are starving people in a lot of places in the world. So it is not just in those poor little countries that we usually don't hear very much about. But all of these signs mark our day and our generation. Then following the dark day of May 1917, 80, uh, we have uh, the, the, when the, the dark day actually happened, we're told that the extent of the darkness was remarkable. Covering northern and eastern part of the North American continent, lasting about 14 hours. Then it, uh, it began about 10 o'clock in the morning <clears throat> and continued until the middle of the next night. People had to light candles. Birds sang their evening songs. Chickens came home to roost. <clears throat> Uh, the poet John Greenleaf Whittier described it in his poem, Abraham Davenport, and this is what he said in his poem. Twice, on a, uh, twas on a May day of the far old year, 1780, that there fell over the bloom and the sweet life of the spring, over the fresh earth and the heaven of noon, a horror of great darkness. Birds ceased to sing, and all the barnyard fowls roosted. The cattle at the pasture bars lowed and looked homeward. Bats on leathered wings flitted abroad. The sounds of labor died. Men prayed. Women wept. All ears grew sharp to hear the doom blast of the trumpet shatter the black sky. They believed it was the end of the world. The night after the, or, yeah, the night after the dark day, the light of the moon was veiled, even as the light of the sun had been during the daylight hours. It actually looked like blood covering the moon. Jesus said that after the great dark day sign, the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. The stars of heaven in Revelation chapter 6 says, fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth its untimely figs when it is shaken of a mighty wind. Fifty-three years after the dark day, fulfilling prophecy just as God said it would happen. On the morning of November 13, 1833, there appeared the greatest star shower known in history. It was seen over wide areas of the United States and other countries. From one center of the sky, near the constellation of Leo, they flew out in every direction. One of the grandest sights that man has ever beheld. This phenomenon was accepted by Christian people at the time as a sign from heaven. It's a sign to us that God does what he says he's going to do. History was fulfilled. Now I want to share the falling of the stars with you from the perspective 
of someone who saw it. Frederick Douglass, a liberated slave, wrote this about the falling stars. I witnessed this gorgeous spectacle and was struck with awe. The air seemed filled with bright descending messengers from the sky. It was about daybreak when I saw the sublime scene. It was not without the suggestion at the moment that it might be the harbinger of the coming of the Son of Man. And in my state of mind, I was prepared to hail him as my friend and deliverer. He must have been a very good Bible student because he went on to say, I had read that the stars shall fall from heaven, and they were now falling. I was suffering much in my mind. I was beginning to look away to heaven, for the rest denied me on earth. Precious testimony. As Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, we're told in Matthew 24 saying, tell us, when will these signs be, and when will be the coming of your kingdom? They wanted to know, what can we look forward to? God gave them the signs that we've just been talking about. He said to them, many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. But before that, he said, take heed, don't let anybody deceive you. We have only to remember David Koresh. Jim Jones, Reverend Moon, and so many, many others that have claimed to be Christ to know that that sign has been fulfilled. And then Jesus said, and you're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not quite yet. You know, there have always been wars in the world since the beginning of sin. But there had never been any such war as the First World War that happened in 1914 through 1918. I remember teaching uh, junior high school one year when we were talking about World War I. And just to see if my students were alive and alert, I said to them, it was a horrible war because I was there. Now, mind you, it ended in 1918, and I could not have possibly been alive during that war. But one of my bright little girls said, oh, Mrs. Birdie, you were really there? <laughs> wake up, Nanette, wake up. I was not there, but it was a terrible war. Because we are told... <coughs> Now, Winston Churchill said it was different from all the ancient wars and from all the modern wars. He said all the horrors of all the ages were brought together. Mankind has never been in this position before, he said. World War I cost the United States alone $30 billion. It seemed a staggering sum at that time, as you can imagine. Some predicted that the country would really go bankrupt. And then followed the World War II. From 1939 to 1945, and I did live in that war. So now you can play a game with my age. But I was very young during that war. <laughs> but I do remember what got rationed during that time. And I remember that we were introduced to oleomargarine. Some of you older folks may remember that. Just a block of grease, really, <laughs> that came with a tiny little capsule of yellow. And you worked it into that, and you made margarine out of it. So that is my memory of World War II. But World War II cost our nation 10 times as much as World War I. 
$300 billion. War is expensive. It is expensive. It ended up with many nations being taken captive. Millions died of starvation. And then finally came the atomic bomb. Thermonuclear, uh, thermonuclear weapons. And now war has taken on a new dimension with missiles and suicide bombers and the threat of chemical warfare. And the hatred in the nations is unprecedented. Is there ever a day when we do not hear in the news something about the war in Iraq? And just recently we heard how the ISIS forces in Iraq have just recently told the, the Christians, you have three options. Convert to Islam, get out of the country, or we're going to stab you to death. Persecution is here, and it is alive and active. And just this last week, France offered asylum to those Christians. Christ went on to say, nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes. All these are the beginning of sorrows. There have always been pestilences in the earth. We have one going on right now. Who can tell me what it is? Ebola. Deadly, deadly virus. Already claimed the lives of almost 800 people. God says, I tell you all these things because I want you to wake up and know that Christ is coming again soon and very soon. We are going to see the King. Amen. And it's going to happen no matter what you believe. And I know we have visitors in our midst this morning, and I would want our visitors to know that Jesus Christ loves you, and he would not let something happen without letting you know it's going to happen. Because he wants to save us. He says, I take no pleasure in the death of anyone. He wants us all to be saved. He wants us in heaven with him. So we've had many pestilences, famines, famines galore. In fact, Tuesday of this week, I, how many of you know where Davis Protestan is? Oh, a few of you do. Well, it's very close to where Melanie and I live. And I stopped by there to get some tomatoes. And I've done that many, 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 many times. I love tomatoes because they're good for the heart. That's what they tell us. So I stopped to get some tomatoes. Last year, and all of this year, the tomatoes have been $1.49 a pound. So I stopped prepared to pay $1.49 a pound. When I walked up to the sign, I could see that they were now $1.99 a pound. When I went inside with a few little things I decided to buy, I said to Sheila Davis, the, uh, the man that owns his wife, Sheila, whatever happened to the cost of tomatoes? And she said, well, that's what they're doing to us. We're just having to pay so much more. And the young man that works for them overheard the conversation. And so he got into the conversation and he said that they had one supplier that was charging $50 a bushel for tomatoes. Stephen King, get your garden going. You can make a fortune. My, I think we should dig up the lawns and plant gardens. And we may need to do that. $50 a bushel for tomatoes. We could easily have a famine here with very, very little uh, effort to stop it. Christ also told the disciples that there would be many floods. We've heard about a lot of them, but there is one flood that I want to talk to you about this morning. It happened on May 31st, 1889, and all these events have taken place chronologically. It had been raining very hard in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. 
The people were accustomed to flooding there because they lived in a river valley. They would just simply take their belongings, move them up to the second floor, wait out the deluge, and move everything back down to first floor. Oh my, but on May 31, they did not count on the breaking away of the South Fork Dam. Within one hour, a body of water, which engineers at that time estimated, moved into that town with the force of Niagara Falls. Rolling into Johnstown uh, with all of this water, now picking up houses and barns and animals and people on its way. The next day after the flood, there were 2,200 people that had lost their lives in that flood. That disaster came like a thief in the night with no warning. Later that year, a woman very inspired by God to write out what he spoke to her of, wrote, The enemy has worked, and he is working still. He has come down in great power, and the Spirit of God is being withdrawn from the earth. God has withdrawn his hand. We have only to look at Johnstown, she said. He did not prevent the devil from wiping that whole city out of existence. And these very things will increase until the close of this earth's history. In Romans chapter 8, verse 33, the author says, For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs. Painful, painful. But I would want to assure you that God has promised us safekeeping. For those that heed the warning and accept the warning, he has most definitely promised us safekeeping. Is there a single one of the signs that Christ talked to the disciples about that has not been fulfilled? No. We are truly on the verge of Christ's return. You can look about you and see it in your own private little community. And he wants so very much for every one of us to be watching and waiting and ready. So what's left to be done? Well, we haven't talked about the shaking, and we don't have time for that. But there will come a great shaking when many bright lights in the churches are going to come out. When the straight testimony is preached, they're going to leave. They don't like what they have heard. Sunday laws have not happened yet, but I can tell you they're in the making. They're in the making. Our country is expecting a visit from Pope Francis. And he is going to come because he's going to talk to us about how to bring peace on the earth. Because I know he genuinely believes that he can help us to bring peace to the world. <clears throat> and he has his thoughts regarding what that's going to be. But when he comes to the United States, he's going to talk to Congress. What he's going to say to Congress, we really do not know, but he's been invited to come and speak to our Congress. Then there will come the close of probation, and right after the close of probation will be the great time of trouble, and then the last plagues will fall. When Christ shall cease his work as mediator in man's behalf, then this time of trouble will begin. Then the case of every soul will have been decided, and there will be no atoning blood to cleanse from sin. When Jesus leaves his position as man's intercessor before God, then he makes this solemn announcement right from the Bible. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And with that, Christ leaves the most holy place. Then Christ returns for his people. Then after we spend a thousand years in heaven with our Lord Jesus, enjoying all the wonderful things he has prepared for those who love him, then the third reason why our earth is important to God takes place. 
So let's go back to Orion. One of the first books I bought after becoming a Seventh-day Adventist was a little book entitled Early Writings. And on page 41 of that little book I read, talking about God's redeemed people, but also talking about Orion, dark, heavy clouds came up and clashed against each other. The atmosphere parted and rolled back. Then we could look right up through that open space in Orion, whence came the voice of God. That voice of God is announcing the day and the hour of Christ's return. And then that little quote on page 41 says, the holy city will come down through that open space in Orion. That's straight from God. Now I want to share something really special for you, and that will give you my number three, Oliverty, reason why that speck in space is so important. The earth itself, the very field that Satan claims that it is, as his, is to be not only ransomed, but exalted. Our little world, that speck in space we've been talking about, under the curse of sin, the one dark blot on his glorious creation will be honored above all the other worlds in the universe of God. Hence, when the Son of Man tabernacled in humanity, where the King of glory lived and suffered and died, here, when he shall make all things new, the tabernacle of God shall be with men and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And through the endless ages, as the redeemed walk in the light of the Lord, they will praise him for his unspeakable gift. We will never run out of something to praise him for. This speck in space is going to become God's headquarters. Amen. Talk about being exalted. When you think of the vastness of the universe, and that right here on earth, God's going to set up his headquarters. It's God, John in Revelation 21 tells us, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Now, I also want to share with you another very special thing I'm looking forward to in the great eternity. We're almost finished. The Garden of Eden remained upon the earth long after man had become an outcast from the pleasant paths. The fallen race were long permitted to gaze upon the home of innocence their entrance barred only by the watching angels. At the cherubim guarded gate of paradise, the divine glory was revealed. Hither came Adam and his sons to worship God. When the tide of iniquity overspread the world and the wickedness of man determined their destruction by a flood of water, the hand that planted Eden withdrew it from the earth. But in the final restitution, when there shall be a new heaven and a new earth, it is to be restored, more glorious adorned than at the beginning. My people shall long enjoy and dwell in a peaceful habitation, God promises. Violence will no longer be heard. I want to walk in the Garden of Eden. In fact, I was thinking, I'm going to go look for Brother Frederick Douglass. And I'm going to say, come, let's take a walk in the Garden of Eden. And there we're going to praise God that the color of a person's skin will never matter. Amen. Never again. Never again. 
as we walk and talk and live in that beautiful, beautiful eternity, we're going to know how precious is the Lord Jesus to have given his life that you and I could ever have that experience. It is my heartfelt desire this morning that you will make a commitment to being there in that holy city when it descends to the earth and that you will be there to also walk with me in the Garden of Eden. Amen. May God help you to maintain that commitment. After such a beautiful message, how can you not join in and sing this song? When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Join in, everybody. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. pray. Oh, Father in heaven, as you look down upon us this morning, we cannot even begin to express the great love you have for each one of us. We are so blessed to know Jesus, and we are so blessed to call you Father, for we are your children. May your love, your peace, the joy of knowing you encourage the heart of every one of us this morning. In Christ's name, amen. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be.
for us a place when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we Shall tread the streets of gold. 